Well, welcome to Profiles in Leadership. This is a series that offers viewers an unprecedented opportunity to glean insights from top leaders who serve in government, education, industry, nonprofit organizations. Viewers can expect to learn proactive, forward-looking, forward-thinking leadership skills, core values and principles of a leader and qualities influential leaders exhibit. Through an interactive fireside chat, set, fireside chat style conversation, guests discuss strategies and principles they have employed to lead strategic change and help transform organizations and society. Today, I am pleased to have Bruce Berman. Bruce is the CEO of Brody Berman Associates, a management consulting and strategic communications firm that helps to dif differentiate intellectual property rights, holders and strategies and support IP transactions and disputes. Brody Berman is best known for helping clients increase profit, enhance value and manage risk. Bruce, Bruce has implemented marketing and business development programs on behalf of more than 200 IP portfolios and businesses. He has counseled many executives, IP holders, investors, and attorneys and their clients. Uh, I should say that his most recent book is The Intangible Investor. He also has edited and contributed to four others. Uh, so please check out his uh, book collection after this. Well, Bruce, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. It's fun to be here. Very pleased to have you. Why don't you tell our viewers a thing or two about yourself that I've not already covered, including <laughs> a fun fact if you have one? A fun fact. Well, that's a hard one. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a communications person by training and by uh, by spirit. You know, and I wanted to bring that uh, those skills to the IP world um, because the IP world, uh, you know, well, it's fascinating and it and it touches so many uh, surfaces. Uh, communications is not the the strength here, so. Uh, that that's how I come to IP, and we can get into that uh, a little further. Okay. Now, Genesis beginnings are important. They say the child is the father of the man. Do you agree with that? I do. So tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I grew up in the New York area, uh, just north of the city in Riverdale. Um, went to public high schools. I went to Dewey Clinton High School. That's if people in New York know that is it's a very large boys high school at the time. Uh, but it graduated oh, James Baldwin, uh, Ralph Lauren, uh, some very prominent people in government and, and business. So um, it's kind of a proud tradition, kind of working class uh, people coming up. Uh, and I went to City College, another kind of, they used to call it the Harvard of the working class. Andy Grove went there. And, uh, you know, I, then I went to Columbia University where I studied uh, film. And people often ask me, how'd you come for, go from film to IP and from frames to claims, as it were? Uh, it's really more plausible than it appears at first. Um, you know, the specific, I, and I didn't know this at the time, but the specificity in, say, uh, a photo or a film is a lot of information. And you need a narrative around, a frame around the frame, as it were, to explain what's going on. Um, similarly, with a patent, in order to give it meaning, you need is all these, all this information, all these subordinate claims. And you, you also need a story around a narrative. Um, and that's sort of what I'm good at doing, helping to flesh things out. And if I can understand it, then other people can understand it. Uh, I started out working with, uh, well, I worked in uh, marketing Wall Street research. That's where I started. I worked with LF Rothschild. Uh, Rothschild is an interesting firm, no longer uh, in business. Um, they focused on bringing uh, tech companies public. Intel, Microsoft at the time. This is in the 80s. Um, they were one of the called the four horsemen who, you know, the banking companies uh, for uh, smallish kind of mid-sized banks for uh, investment banks. But in working with them and helping them do marketing, they had a dozen uh, tech analysts, you know, mini computers, they called them at the time, micro computers, no PCs. Uh, so I had to learn a little bit about each area as well as pharma. Uh, and biotech, which is just really starting out. 
And uh, I liked that. You know, it was really enjoyable, and I, I learned a lot. It was like a little, uh, I was like an archaeologist going around to each uh, each person. So that uh, that got me going and interested in tech. This was in the in kind of the mid '80s, and uh, uh, you know, I had no tech background at the time. Then around '89, '90, a case that some of your listeners may remember, uh, it was a Polaroid v Kodak, big case. Billion or nine hundred and seventy million dollar uh, award, I believe, which was paid uh, at the time. That was in nineteen ninety. So in today's dollars, that's about two point two billion dollars. Uh, Kenyon, <clears throat> the firm that represented uh, Kodak, uh, mitigated damages. They could have been three, four, five times higher than that. Of course, no one remembers that. It's actually an excellent book out called uh, Tri uh, Triumph of Genius about the case, it's about 700 pages. I picked it up uh, and I said, you're not gonna read this, are you? And it's a terrific book, I couldn't put it down. That's how good it is. Uh, so if you're interested in litigation at all, let alone that case, uh, you really must uh, read it. Uh, Ron Fierstein wrote it. He was uh, represented Fish on the case, uh, on the Polaroid side. But anyway, so so Kodak lost. Uh, the, the fees were not bad. You know, they're in the ten million dollar range, I think, or more. So, but it but it sullied their reputation. Um, you know, they were an 1854 established firm, uh, pretty conservative, almost no plaintiffs on their roster, all defendants uh, defending uh, cases. Um, and uh, I knew my partner at the time, Ira Brody, knew. An, an associate there and they said come on in and let's let's talk um they didn't know what pr was even uh, or marketing or anything uh, they, they, their their business card dated back to i think 1854 they hadn't changed the font or or anything so they um they hired us brody berman for about almost five years we worked with them but you know how you know engineers are they like to deconstruct things so they wanted to know how I worked, and I, I'm fine with that. I want to be transparent. There is a method to our madness uh, and a logic and a skill. It's not just sending out a lot of press releases. And they they liked that. And they similarly wanted me to understand why they were good and, and how they worked. So they invited me into everything. And I didn't have to take the LSATs. I didn't have to take the bar. <laughs> so I remembered everything because I didn't have to. So I remembered everything. And it was fun. It was enjoyable. So uh, I got into that, and uh, that sort of prepared me for the IP world. Uh, you know, prior to that, I had some awareness of copyright uh, and, and a vague awareness of patents and trademark, but really uh, not a real knowledge. I, I had taught film at Columbia University, where I received my master's uh, in scholarship and uh, in film, and I also uh, pursued the PhD uh, in film scholarship uh, where I did the coursework and my written comprehensives and uh, my dissertation topic was approved, but I, I, I didn't finish. I didn't, I felt at that time, I, I did what Bill Gates and Steve Jobs did, you know, I, and, and, uh, uh, and others, I just, I said, that's enough of that. <laughs> and that didn't hurt any of you. No, I, I guess not. Uh, although at the time, I, I didn't know. I started an urge to sort of complete it at some point, just to say I did it. And so you can call me doctor, you know, I guess. So I'm going to ask you the same yeah. question that your clients from way back when at Kenyon asked you. How do you do it? What well, is your... You know, it's like any other consulting gig, if you will. Um, understand the client, understand the needs, understand the audience. Uh, manage expectations. You know, you can't move a mountain. You know, you you can certainly uh, uh, move in the right direction. Uh, with regard to litigation, uh, if you're working with a law firm, say, and that's not the only folks I worked with, or their client, uh, you know, that case in most instances in the last 20 or 30 years, if it's, a, if it's substantial, even if it isn't, it's going to play out in some way publicly. Uh, and it's important that the facts be clear and precise, especially, you know, if you're vulnerable, say you're a plaintiff, uh, you're an NP, you know, you're particular two strikes against you already, <laughs> but even still, even if you're a defendant, um, so 
it's a kind of a high wire act because you don't want to be overly visible and take out ads and be, you know, send out press releases. But at the same time, you have to be mindful of what's being reported, who's reporting it, how is it being reported, uh, is it accurate, um, and what can you do, if anything, to change it? Um, so, you know, that's uh, there's a lot of subtlety. I find lawyers, you know, great to work with. They're smart. They get things. If they see there's logic to it and, and, and a risk factor, which can be measured, they're all in. You know, they're, they're good students. Um, you know, others are, are reluctant to say anything. But l more and more today, people know they have to say something. And it may not be, you know, s someone asked me in, a, in another podcast, is it about influencing the case? And it is and it isn't, you know, uh, judges and courts and juries and, and uh, experts, they all read IP Watchdog and, uh, well, not IP Watchdog, but they read the newspaper. And the newspaper people at Wall Street Journal and Times, they read IP Watchdog and IP Law 360. So, uh, you know, it does matter. It does filter How up. How closely do you work with the mainstream media? And for that matter, the specialized media. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in some cases, very closely with the mainstream media. A, a famous uh, or case history, Brody Berman case history, if you will, <laughs> is, uh, oh, wow, must have been uh, 11 or 12, 13 years ago when Allied Security, and I could talk about it now because it's public, Allied Security Trust was being formed, AST. Um, they, I think it was uh, Joe Byers at the time from HP. He didn't want to announce it. He felt, let's if we can't get a Wall Street Journal story here, I don't want to announce it. I don't want to just give it to anyone. It's going to get lost. I, I, I didn't agree with that, frankly. My feeling and my philosophy and others is do a lesser story or a story for a lesser publication, but make sure that story is accurate. And if it's accurate, others will get it. But but if the big story doesn't happen, or if it happens and it's incorrect or not precise enough, that's a problem. Anyway, so he waited and waited. And at that time, a lot of folks knew AST was formed. You know, and there were some big companies involved, Google and Motorola and Kodak, and I'm trying to remember at the time HP. I think Intel was involved, you know, a lot of the, the big names. So the danger was. And, and the possibility that it would come out and people would think of it as some kind of collusive thing between big tech companies. And that was my fear, frankly. And it's not at all, of course. And we know that. But at the time, we didn't know how people jump on these things. Um, so about six months into this, where every almost everyone in the industry knew AST existed, uh, you know, but it hadn't been announced officially. I get a call from a journal and that uh, they knew everything. They knew what the law firm who formed it was and what they were being paid. They knew every, someone gave them a file. They leaked it. Some, one of the, one of the, uh, I guess, members. And um, it, uh, it got out and, and I, I, then I had to deal with, with, it was Don Clark at the, at the wall street journal at the time. And, you know, I had to say, look, Don, if you if you, it sounds good, you have this sounds pretty accurate. But if you don't get it out, like immediately, I'll have to put out a press release and then others will have it because it's being leaked and we don't know who's going to come up with the information, how they're going to handle it. So uh, he did run it. He ran it uh, uh, as a page one story uh, on the on the second uh page one, not the, the market, the second section, page one. And uh, it was very, it was a good story. And as fearful as the members were about it, and they were, because we had to tell them the story was in, in works, uh, and didn't want to have anything to do with it. So they let Brian Hinman, who at the time was, uh, had not yet gone to Phillips. I think he was at Verizon, as I recall. Now he hasn't, he hadn't even gone there. So he was he was the AST chairman or CEO, and uh, he was the spokesperson. And then I got calls from members saying, "Well, what, why couldn't I comment on that? I could have done that <laughs> because it came out and it looked good." Uh, but a few weeks later, Brian had left to go to Verizon. But it worked out well, and uh, 
that was when I dealt directly uh, with uh, major media. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it was, you know, a positive experience, but it, 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 it could have gone quite negative. I want to ask you about your technique of moving from frames to claims. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're absolutely right. IP is a complicated business and many people don't get the messaging right. Well, what is your thought process? Tell us when you have a client, what, how do you start understanding what their business is about? How do you focus on the essence of what you need to communicate? And then how do you do that effectively? Sure. Well, Daryl, depends on the on the company, of course, and the industry, uh, and the assets involved. Uh, you know, we like to we know enough. We don't just say, "Here's an announcement. Put out the announcement." That's not our business. I mean, if we have to put out a press release, we will, but we don't generally. What 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 is the technology? What makes it unique? Is it just that you think it's unique, or the patents say it's unique, or or uh, are there others who really have a, a sense of how important this technology is? So I, I would say it's about sort of the work of, of, a, of a patent attorney, not unlike that. You want to deconstruct, you want to understand what's there, and, uh, and then you can better deal with it and be honest with a, a journalist or, or whomever. Um, but if you're just being told, oh, this is great stuff and we have patents all over the place and, you know, we, you know, we deserve to win, you know, that that's, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Not with me. So how, how would you know that you have succeeded? If you are an attorney and you've won a case or you've mitigated damages, there's a binary result and it's tangible and it's visible. In your case, it, you're dealing with the but for it could be a lot worse it could be a lot better so how do you know that you've hit the market how do you more importantly convince your client that you've hit the market right well you have to manage expectations you know a story that runs or doesn't run or a story that's uh, less uh less dangerous to the law firm's client uh it's sort of a, a, a very uh, a soft return you know, it's hard to to prove what that really meant. But I think I think the lawyers today are aware of how the media works, how it can help a case or hurt a case or help uh, uh, an asset or not. Um, I've had clients who have asked me, it's very difficult. They, they are very strong licensors. They've, they've made hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in licensing, but they can't announce the deals. You know, the deals are private. So how do you get the word out that they succeeded? Well, sometimes it's a matter of just quietly, subtly, uh, without too much definition. Uh, and I have credibility because I don't, I don't just spread rumors. You know, if I say these guys are really good, you know, they're still signing seven-figure deals in, in the middle of COVID. They're signing five, six, eight million dollar deals, um, licensing deals. That's not bad, um, and it was true. You know, but you, I had to kind of tell a few people who really understood what that meant. Sometimes it's as simple as that, um, but it, it's it's uh, you know sometimes more art than science. <laughs> and when we, you think about your business, uh, there are two aspects to it. Of course, you are trying to recruit clients and you're trying to retain clients. What's your approach to both of these? Mm. Yeah, well, we're small. So the nice thing about being small is that you don't need a huge number of clients. You need clients all the time, new ones. But we don't, you know, just take anyone on. There, there are a lot, one time is a term that I call I coin called PIPCO, public IP company. It really means public IP licensing company or public IP patent licensing company. And there are a lot of them at one time. I think there was as many as 30 or 40. They're probably down to 10 or 12 now, depending on how you define the term. But um, I wouldn't work with most of them because probably they should not have been public. Uh, they were taking public money, uh, you know, equity uh, investments that, you know, I, you know I, I couldn't say for sure it wouldn't work out, but it, it didn't look like these companies were going to go anywhere. And indeed they didn't for the most part. And I steered uh, clear of most of them. 
-hmm. And then retaining clients. Retaining is all, it's like law firms, it's all about service. That's professional service. So you have to manage expectations, uh, show uh, return on investment. And, and mostly I find it's not about the cash. We don't have the money this quarter or this year. It does happen, but it's more about the risk. And, and if I do this activity, which is new to them and they've never done before, perhaps, um, what's the risk factor? You know, one time I was talking to a client and they were dealing with an inv investor relations, this law firm uh, person at a major tech company. And um, uh, they thought the IR person had like a lot of input. But they really don't, you know, it's really, uh, it's really up to the lawyers and, and the risk factor, you know, it, stock price is important, but they're not determining how to handle, you know, IP issues or litigation or what have you. Um, so I don't know, is that, does that answer your question? It does. It does. Uh, shift gear slightly. Yeah. Because you have several heads and we want to make sure that we cover all of them. You write as well. From ideas to assets, we talked about the book that you um, have done. You've done several books, in fact. Walk us through your thought process from deciding what topic to focus on. Um, how do you conceive of the topic from beginning to end and, and walk us through that process? Sure. Well, some of the books are, are kind of compendia or compendium or a compendium uh, of people's writing. But in a way, it's harder to to edit and write the book that way than if I wrote it myself. You know, it, it, there's more editing involved, more shaping, and getting the right people to write the right article or right chapter. Like we had a chapter how to read a how to read a patent, which someone from Morgan Finnegan, the fellow who who uh, pro, uh, uh, filed the Priceline, I think you, you, yeah, Priceline.com patent, which was a seminal patent. Uh, back then, he wrote that chapter, How to Read a Patent. But uh, but to answer your question, um, from ideas to assets, for example, I started that around 1999. Wow, sounds like a long time ago. And uh, there was no book that a business executive or investor could read, let alone other lawyers, that kind of dealt with aspects like how to read a patent, you know, patent attorney shouldn't need that, but a lawyer might need that. Uh, who's not a patent attorney or, or uh, you know, uh, an investor certainly, uh, executives, managers, uh, and there were a series of chapters in there. I think there were twenty or thirty chapters. It was a big book um, that uh, dealt with aspects of IP more for business executives uh, and investors, somewhat for the legal community as well, for the IP community. Um, and that was sort of a thought that we needed that. And it's funny because years later, that book did fairly well. Um, I would see at conferences like established partners at law firms, and they'd say, you know, I read that book in high school, or I read that book as an undergraduate, and it really, you know, encouraged me to, to go on. And that, that feels good. Is, is um, that your best known work? Uh, from ideas to assets, I don't know. Yeah, probably is. Yes. Yeah. It had the best cover, you know, so I guess it's the best. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say it had the best cover? Cover. Yeah. Yeah. It had a great cover. I remember. I remember they, good, they did a good job on the art. But from that came, I'm trying to remember the titles now, from ideas to assets and from assets to profits. Because uh, idea becomes an asset, then you have an asset. It's nice on the balance sheet or somewhere in, in your company, but has the asset become profitable? So that, that was like the next stage. Uh, and then he did making innovation pay, which focused more on licensing. Uh, it was a kind of a, a next step, if you will, monetization. And now you have the intangible investor. So talk a bit about that. Yeah, well, that comes out of, I don't know if you're, you're familiar, Ben Graham, Benjamin Graham, who was- The intelligent uh, investor. The intelligent, exactly. So this is kind of a play on that. And it's also, you know, intangible assets um, are what we're talking about, but also the intangible investor um, 
is someone who's an investor, but also isn't there physically, you know, like who's really an investor in IP. I mean, some people would say it's those folks. We did this on our podcast recently uh, who, uh, who buy I patents, you know, and monetize them. Well, they are kind of investor, but it's folks who do R and D are, are, IP investors, you know, it's uh, shareholders in tech companies or, or brand companies, they're IP investors. They don't think of themselves that way, and they should, really, in, in my opinion. So the intangible investor is sort of a take on IP value, IP investing, return on IP, IP trends and performance. So writing is also a form of expressing thought leadership. And in addition to your books, you write for IAM and other outlets. So when you decide that's where I want to commit my time and energy, is it just to get information out there? Are you trying to shape the narrative? What, what is your strategic goal in deciding on your projects? Hmm. Uh, you know, it's really uh, something that needs to be done. That's There's a, a lack in the marketplace or in the uh, literature. Um, you know, there are a lot of books on IP now, but the time I wrote From Ideas to Assets or put it together, and I wrote a couple of chapters. I wrote a chapter on, on brand and patent, an area that's still not really uh, uh, that well developed. Uh, like, for example, just quickly, quick digression, Micron technology, incredible technology, incredible patents. People still don't know who they are. There's no brand there. You know, and conversely, you they know, McDonald's, pardon me? They need to talk to you. Well, well, they need to talk to someone. Uh, conversely, McDonald's at one time had six patents. Microsoft in the 90s had a handful, like maybe less than tw fewer than 20 patents, you know, but they had a brand. So the brand can help the patent uh, value and the patent value or good patents can help a brand, but they're not often put together. There are a handful of companies that kind of get that. L'Oreal is one of them. They have a lot of patents and a very strong brand. And there are others who, who I think today more people understand that. Um, but um, I'm sorry. So we're, we're, do, the do question, people know about you through word of mouth, or do you have a yes? Mostly word of mouth. Writing helps. Uh, you know, my feeling is if I'm transparent with my thinking and philosophy, uh, my knowledge of IP, which is not vast. I mean, people, lawyers, I've worked with for days at a time. At the third day, working with a patent attorney, a good one actually. He said, "So where did you practice?" And I said, "Well, I'm." Uh, in practice, I didn't go to law school, you know. So I'm the poster child. You know, I didn't go to, I have no technical, legal, or business background formally, um, but I picked up a lot along the way. But yet I understand IP, I think, pretty well. I mean, I can't so would read. You say, say it's fair to characterize one of your characteristics, I'd say, as a thought leader, as one who is versatile, who is able to adapt and um, transcend different industries. Yes. Yeah. I think part of the fun of being a consultant is sort of like an anthropologist, like you're being, uh, you're, you're, you're digging down into different corporate cultures, uh, in, in, into different, not just products, but, but the corporate culture is very interesting uh, to me. Uh, even within law firms, there are cultures and, uh, you know, getting to understand it and work within it is, it's part of the fun, I think, of, of doing what I do. It's really management consulting, you know, it's really what it is. Do you have a typical day in your life or is every day different? Every day is pretty different. Um, but today, these days with the Center for Intellectual Property Understanding, which is the nonprofit that I co-founded with uh, Judge Michelle and uh, Marshall Phelps back in 2016, that takes up a good chunk of my time. I'd say it's sometimes, sometimes half of my time depends, you know. What prompted the three of you to come together and decide this was something important to do? Well, it seemed there needed to be a clearer, clearer articulation of the issues involved with IP. This is, I guess, after AIA. AIA was uh, 2020, 2011, Im implemented in 2012. And there's just still the patent troll narrative was still alive, more alive than ever today, unfortunately. Um, and 
you know, how do you get to people? I think Judge Michelle felt more of a policy uh, desire push to really influence legislators. He's probably right, but that's not what we do. Uh, I think we just sort of, we don't want to draw a line in the sand and say, we're the good guys, here are all the bad guys, you know, let us help you understand why they're the bad guys, you know, that's not what we do. But I think to raise consciousness about IP, even within the IP profession, you know, there are a few things we all agree on, whether you're a pharma company, you're a content provider, you're big tech or, or an in, independent inventor, IP is misunderstood, it's often undervalued, and it's frequently infringed. You know, we all kind of agree on that, but we don't agree on how to get that message outside of the profession. And uh, and what are the differences within, uh, you know, there's different agenda within the IP world. So people see things differently. Um, it seems very obvious to us probably and to lawyers, you know, who you work with different clients and you, you see, you know, what their needs are. But I think to even sophisticated investors don't get that. You know, why, so why is the, the no, go, go ahead. ahead. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Finish that thought. Sorry. I said, feel free to finish that thought. That's oh, a different well, question. No, I, I, I was just saying it, you know, it's, it's just very difficult for folks to understand what is, what is the agenda? How does say tech's agenda differ from pharma's agenda? How does uh, content providers like Disney, big content providers, how do they differ from, uh, you know, uh, like black content creators on TikTok? You know, they, they're all, they're both content creators, but they have different needs with regard to many things, but certainly with regard to IP rights. And putting it in that context helps people understand why IP, why is it important? You know, who does it affect? How does it work? Talk about how you got the center of the ground. You started off, people might know each of you individually, but they're not familiar with the center. Today, the center is well known. You are running events and doing other good work, but how do you get from that starting point to where you are today? Good question. Um, well, Marshall was helpful. You know, he had been a uh, head of IP, VP of IP uh, uh business at uh, Microsoft, first at IBM. And then then Bill Gates brought him out of retirement. He put a gun to his head and said, you're going to come to work for us practically. Um, so he was able to help get a grant from Microsoft initially to start us off. And that, that was great. Um, but then ironically, uh, Microsoft, which had gone from like fewer no patents to many patents and many licenses, uh, got more involved in the cloud became a more of a, a cloud oriented company they acquired red hat this was probably before then uh and their take they still had 40,000 or so patents but their take on on being positioned as an ip leader changed <laughs> so uh and i respect that i understand they weren't against what we're doing but they they just weren't you know putting a lot of time and and uh, effort into uh supporting us so uh you know, so, but we, we have other, we have organizations like Kellogg School of Business supports us, the Michelson Institute does, Astellas Pharma, the second largest pharma company in uh, Japan. Very interesting company and really understand what we're doing and really appreciate it. How, uh, how do those conversations take place? Do you go out and, and solicit these collaborations or do they come to you or some combination yeah. of both? Some combination, uh, but often we'll, you know, talk to people and sometimes, you know, they, they want to really kick the tires, especially with something they don't understand or know what we're doing. Uh, so they'll watch us for a while. They don't say that, but I know they do. And they come to an event, they see what we're doing, what I'm writing about, and they see that it's not, it's not harmful to them or anyone really. Uh, and then they, they become more comfortable to, uh, to do that. We've had, Number of folks for a year, uh, several years, uh, support us. Uh, Clarivate has, uh, trying to remember uh, over the years. Um, you know, we've had good, good uh, support. Financial support is difficult. You know, it's a you, you don't want to have to spend too much time doing that, but uh, but in reality, is you do, because it's you know there are finite dollars there. Uh, I don't want to be in the event business. We do events. 
but I'm not going to compete with the IAM or uh, or any other organization. Um, we could perhaps and and make more money, but it's like a full time job being in the event business, and that's so not how, our strength. How much fundraising do you do for the center? Uh, most of it, and uh, it. Uh, how much time does it take? Um, try to limit it, but uh, you know. Like this season right now where we are is a big fundraising uh, uh, season. Reason being that once the IP Awareness Summit, which is taking place in Boston this year on May 2nd, uh, that's been formed. Uh, the, the agenda is pretty well set. The speakers are pretty clear. Um, that, and I can probably say on this podcast because it won't be uh, uh, released for a couple of weeks, right? Well, that's sorry. We, 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 we can embargo it for a couple of weeks if it's okay. Embargo. Uh, Kara, <laughs> Kara Miller, who was the host of Innovation Hub on uh, NPR for ten years, uh, and she's she writes the uh, the big idea column for the Boston Globe. She's going to be our keynote, and we're going to announce that actually uh, this week. Um, but once that's set and people know what they're what they're getting. Uh, so to speak, then they decide, okay, I can pull the trigger on this. Not, not everybody waits that long, but I think it's it's just reassuring to them. And it's a nice group of people. I mean, we get about 80, 100 people and we get some uh, virtually the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, it's really, uh, my challenge is, and the, my board's challenge is, or they challenge me, is not just to have one type of folks. I mean, we have lawyers, certainly, investors it's really important to get knowledgeable investors professional investors involved because they have a different take on ip and return on ip than maybe we do and sometimes it's fairly sophisticated it's not just about buying a patent and, and enforcing it and making a lot of money you know it's not always it's rarely about that really um we have educators like yourself um james conley at uh, kellogg school of management um uh, at Berkeley, uh, why can't I think of Berkeley? Uh, da uh, David Teese at Berkeley, uh, economist, uh, very interesting guy, um, and, and others. Uh, uh, Mickey uh, uh, Pyatt at Chicago Kent, who I think you know, Mickey. Um, but these are these are educators who have a take on IP, a care about IP, and and want to see it better positioned in the curriculum. Uh, so those are important people, we feel. Um, so fund fundraising is, in a set, can be a very fierce, vicious business. Everybody's after the dollar. Who would you consider your competition to be? And how do you convince your donors that their dollar should come to you rather than some other that, organization? That That's a valid question and a good one. <clears throat> uh I, I would say some of the big guys, but you know, they're they're like, for example, IPO Education Foundation uh, or IPO. I we who we work with, we work with a lot of these folks. The idea is that we CIPU doesn't want to reinvent the wheel, and and if we can, there's a lot of good information, a lot of good content that's siloed in various websites and. And and within organizations, and our, our, we pride ourselves. I do myself, and my committees do to find that and, and bring it to people's attention through us. And if if it's not there and there's something we can do better, then we should do it. But you know, very judiciously we move ahead with new projects. We don't have a, a great deal of budget. But to to answer your question, um, you know, it's not a matter of saying we're better than this. Or do, what do we do well? Uh, and perhaps what others don't do at all or don't do as well. I, we don't put it that way, but w I think we're good at boiling things down to essences. You know, within the IP world, uh, I, I think people get ahead of themselves, especially people like, you know, like, like, like ourselves, professionals who are around this all the time. Assume that everyone knows what AIA means uh, and, and 101 is important and those issues are all so front and center to us, but they're not to others and they should be. They should be aware of them. And if nothing else, they should be aware 
even as young as 10 years old, of certain major issues, not issues, principles of IP. IP is property. You know, IP infringement has impact. It affects people, companies, economies. Uh, you know, th there are three or four principles which I'd like everyone to sort of agree with if they do and, and at least articulate. Uh, you know, in Co University of Co uh, Colorado, uh, I was talking to a professor there, and they're trying to get uh, IP education, some of it, some level, on the civics curriculum in high school. So when you study civics, citizenship, you learn about IP. And I think that's a great idea because it's not just about creating the next generation of creators or, or making the next generation of creators better. That's important and it should be done and is being worked on. But what about the next generation of users? You know, do they will they know enough to appreciate content when they see it and respect it? Uh, whether it's invention or content or a brand, um, I don't think so. You know, I think some some places, yes, but unless they're taught to respect and why and what the implications of not respecting IP are, it's going to be very difficult. And of course, there are forces out there, as you well know, Daryl, that uh, belittle IP and patents and patent holders and patent enforcers. You know, and when you see that in the media, it becomes very difficult to inform people and get their attention about uh, IP and why it's important. And part of what you do to further that awareness is the Understanding IP Matters podcast. Yes, yes. Tell us about how that came about, what that strategic purpose of the podcast is, and if you like your best hits. <laughs> well, there have been uh, two seasons so far. We really haven't finished the second season. Uh, we're going to extend it a bit. Uh, so there have been 14 podcasts to date. Uh, it, it focuses on uh, kind of the IP story of entrepreneurs and also managers, uh, executives, uh, usually around the theme. And sometimes we interview individuals. Sometimes we do a, a pair of people. Um, we've done uh, David Teese and uh, um, Patrick Kilbride from the uh, Global Innovation Policy Center talking about China, uh, and that was an interesting one. Uh, we're going to continue to have the, con the China conversation at the, the IP Awareness Summit in Boston, and now that's really front burner for a variety of reasons. Uh, it's in the news. Um, the one with uh, Gene Quinn, who's the editor and publisher of uh, IP Watchdog, and Sue Decker, who was a chief litigation, IP litigation reporter and IP reporter at Bloomberg. They're both feisty, outspoken, and had really interesting things to say. And that was fun together. They were, uh, and they actually know each other, or, or they know people in common from where they grew up just by happenstance. So it was kind of funny. Um, those were all good. Uh, I think Trade Secrets with Jim Pooley was a very interesting one. Um, trying to think of others. How do you pick oh. topics and speakers? Yeah, it's a good question. I'd like to. I'd like to not just have patents. I like to address content and brand. I don't do it as much as we should. Uh, but really, it's folks who I I think are interesting, who have something to say about you know, what they're going to say, not just uh, do it. And um, we did one uh, just, it, it it dropped, as they say, in the parlance uh, last week um, with uh, Efrat uh, Kasnick, who's a valuation expert in Silicon Valley. She teaches at Stanford. And uh, Adam Gill, uh, who, uh, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, um, he, his firm, GPS Capital, I believe is the, how you, pronounce it, uh, was involved in the uh, Samsung case and uh, $150 million award. I think I mentioned that earlier. Um, so that that dropped just recently, and that was quite interesting given uh, what's gone on. I think they're all pretty good. And, you know, I urge people to, uh, you can go to uh, IP awareness, uh, uh, no, actually uh, understandingip.com. That's the CIPU website and can find it there or on Apple or Spotify 
or uh, you know, just Google it. You you, you can find these uh, podcasts. Uh, they're short, usually under thirty minutes, sometimes thirty five. Uh, so it doesn't take up a, a lot of time. You can, you can listen while you're uh, you're jogging or doing the dishes or whatever. <laughs> and you have a great radio voice. So Bruce Berman will uh, accompany you as you get your steps in. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk about um, mentors and mentees. You are a thought leader and all leaders to some extent are influenced by somebody or some movement or group of people. Who would you say has been your professional influence? And also thinking forward in terms of mentees do you have folks that you are mentoring mm -hmm. well i i think ken madsen who was the managing partner at kenyon was very influential here's an old style you know old old school uh patent attorney chemical engineer and chemical engineers are just brilliant i'm just in awe of them and what, what really impresses me about chemical engineers is that they don't have to prove to you they're smart you know like some people have to let you know they're the smartest person in the room they, they do the opposite, if anything. But uh, but Ken Madsen was important uh, because he he took time to understand what I did and he wanted me to really understand what they did. Um, who else was important? Uh, Jim Gould at uh, Morgan and Finnegan was another one who a great student, another chemical engineer by by coincidence. Um, and a uh, great, great attorney. At one time, uh, Morgan and Finnegan had seven of the 13 largest awards, uh, patent awards, were theirs. And then they became more of a, a defendant uh, uh, firm. So my challenge there was how do you explain what they're doing well when they're mitigating damages? They're not winning awards. They're mitigating damages. That was a great assignment. It was not easy. Uh, but we did. We I think we uh, we 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 definitely uh, helped them help the the IP world understand that. But um, but who are influences? Uh, so you know, Madsen was um, hard to say. Um, I think what about uh, mentees. mentees. Uh, well, I I've I've mentored through the LES business program, LES uh, business plan competition. They asked me to. Uh, to help, you know, uh, you know, to volunteer to to guide a student, and basically, you know, it's it's not rocket science. Uh, it's actually easier for a non IP lawyer probably to do than a than a lawyer. But um, what in the business plan should be included with regard to IP in their business plan? I, and there was a student from uh, well, these weren't students; they were actually entrepreneurs. One in uh, uh, Kenya and one in Uganda that I worked with and each year uh, for two years and, and they both won the top award. So I felt pretty good. And, and what did I tell them? I just told them, you know, if they had uh, uh, hardware, you know, are, are you protecting it in some way? And if you have a brand and a name, do you, do you, do you plan to uh, franchise this? Do you, will you need a trade, you know, basic stuff. Um, but just make sure it's included in, in, in the plan. Any reason why Africa in particular? Well, they just now they offered it, and I, they were giving an award. I think it was five or ten thousand uh, dollars LES to the best business plan, uh, and I, maybe it was international. So uh, they got them from all over, and they said, "Do you want to work with this person?" I said, "Sure." So we we did that, and then we did a video, actually, kind of a why is IP important type video with students from University of Colorado, which uh, I worked with. Uh, it was kind of there their mentor in that. And I thought it worked out pretty well, you know. So uh, our last 10 yards, I'm going to ask you a question in two parts and you can answer it however you like. Uh, what should we expect from Bruce, Bruce Berman in the next chapter of <laughs> his life, his career? As I said, do it whatever, however you like. And is, is there anything else you want our viewers to know? Well, you know, I'd like to take... Um, a CIPU Center for Intellectual Property Understanding to the next level. Uh, you know, we 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 don't want to be IPO Education Foundation or LES or, but there is need to simplify, and and to focus for a group to focus on making things easier, 
and making thing making it easier for professionals to explain. I think this is a fiduciary responsibility. If you, if you know IP, you know how it works. Um, I I think you really need to articulate that to the public. Um, there's too much misinformation, and uh, and and they become they're easily manipulated. You know the public because you know the patent troll meme is a good example. They just uh, you know they hear it and they assume, oh yeah, you're licensing patents, you're a patent troll. Um, the other day, apropos to this, there's without going into too much detail, there's camera technology which is revolutionary. It's allowed a seven or eight thousand dollar video camera to be incredible. It's really a a compression algorithm which allows you to shoot really, really high, super high definition without much loss uh, and, and readily. So there's a guy who's like a camera guru, a podcaster, and he's like bad mouthing this company, Red, for coming up with this and not sharing it. <laughs> and uh, they license it and they want to license it, but because they're not licensing it, they're patent trolls. I mean, really, I mean, that he could sort of get away with that is just like, it bothers me, you know, it's, it's, it's dangerous. And uh, is he ignorant? You know, sometimes it's just, he doesn't understand how it works or is there an agenda here? Are there other camera manufacturers that really want to have access to this, uh, these patents, this, in, these inventions, and they just want to create an environment where maybe validity will be a question, become a question. I think it's probably uh, the former, you know, or the, I'm sorry, the latter. Um, I don't know. I don't know. But that sort of thing is really dangerous and, and uh, harmful, I think. So the next chapter is to raise consciousness, do it in an interesting way, a fun way, uh, get people in business, in IP pro professions, in IP law and other areas, investors more committed to being uh, clear about IP rights and clear about agenda. I think agenda always going to exist, but making going on about business as many journalists do in the business press, as if there is no agenda, it's just, you know, patents and law and there's agenda here, you know, and that's why tech publications are awful with regard to patents. Usually, uh, you know, I won't mention names, but the, the tech publications don't cover patent cases very fairly because they don't they don't like patents, frankly, for the most part. Do people know that? We know that, but do, does the world know that? No, probably not. And it's not. I, I don't want to be an investigative reporter or or do that work, and I, I don't want to you know have a line in the sand. But I do want to raise consciousness, and I think it's uh, it's really important uh, for everyone. And thank you for the important work that you do. This brings us uh, to a close of our leadership profiles and leadership series with Bruce Berman. Thank you again for joining us, Bruce. Thank you for having me, Daryl. It, it was a pleasure. Thank you.